Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen and come to see us. Uh, today we have the privilege, a big privilege, to welcome Wuji Su in our meetup group. Uh, me personally, I have been always inspired by the controversial subjects that Woody is bringing to the job space. So thank you, Woody, for being with us today. So before starting, uh, I just want to ask you, be fully present. The subject is really very interesting. Listen actively. Uh, we have few ground rules. Um, so we expect today more than 50, 100, 400 people uh, registered. So we'll see how many people will come, but we have a lot of people. So please, uh, if you're not speaking, mute yourself and I will be muting you regularly. We want to have a good flow in the conversation. Um, we have constantly people joining. That's fine. We have a waiting room for the people who are not still here. If you have a question, put your question in the chat and put the word Q question or Q. That will help us so we can gather all the questions. And if you have a lot of questions, we can hold a, a special Q&A session uh, for everyone uh, in a good time um, a little bit later. So you're f uh, feel f welcome to rename your name, add your name and the city or the country you're coming from. This will be really fun to, uh, to see. So our group, so we have, uh, our group's name is Agile Manager. We have more than 1800 people uh, who joined. Uh, the vision is to be a leading resource for the Agile Management coaching and best practices. We have also a strategy and part of our strategy is to invite uh, internationally recognized speakers as Woody uh, to help you uh, be up to date with the latest trends and tools. Uh, you can follow us on uh, YouTube. Uh, in the YouTube channel, we have uh, different sessions and recordings from the past. And this session will be recording as well record it as well. So uh, we are a group of uh, people who are passionate about agility. Oscar, myself, Malika, Jordan, Remy, Leila, and Seren. Usually we take the time to introduce everyone, but we don't have a time right now. So I will be skipping this. I'm sorry um, about that, but I think everyone would like to hear from Woody. And the next meetup, uh, so feel free to join us uh, in February again. It's February 17 uh, from 5 p.m. EST. Uh, so we'll be talking about enterprise agile coaching. We have three great international coaches uh, who will be talking about the, the latest enterprise agile coaching book. So feel free to come and uh, ask questions. Um, so this is coming on February 17. So uh, that's it. Now I will leave uh, the time to Woody. We'll have five to 10 minutes at the end for questions. Put your questions in the chat and then we'll see how much we can answer at the end. All right. So Woody. Feel free to jump in, share your screen, All and right. introduce Thank you. yourself. Thank Welcome. you so much. So yeah, I'm Woody Zool. I'm a, I consider myself a software developer. I've been writing software for something like, um, oh, 40 years. Uh, this talk today is one that I've given many times, but I pretty much try to completely rewrite it for this particular presentation. And I've spent about 40 or 50 hours over the last two weeks rewriting this and I still am not real happy with where I'm at, but I have a lot to cover. So I'm gonna move pretty quickly uh, through this stuff. Try to keep up if you can, and I apologize for that, but let's see how it goes. So the first thing I wanna do is a little bit of an exercise that I'm gonna ask you to go to a link that I'm gonna share in our, um, in our, I gotta just pick it up. And uh, I just need to go to where I can pick it up. So uh, give me one more second. I'm gonna put it into the chat. And this is this Mentimeter thing. Mentimeter allows you to go to a link and I'm gonna ask you to answer that question that I have right there. In one word, please no more than one word. Um, 
use, give me a word that describes the essence of what we mean by estimate. So I'm going to need to go to our um, chat. And of course, it's hidden from me. This always happens to me. Give me a moment. Um, let me go to the chat. I'm going to paste in the chat this Mentimeter link. Looks like it worked. It should be on right now. So if it's not, uh, let me know. But you should be able to put in your idea in, in just one word. It looks like we have a few people uh, coming in already. As quick as you can, put in one word. What do we mean by estimate when we say estimate? If your boss comes to you and says, I need your estimate by the end of the day, uh, what word would they use instead? Something like that. So somebody's telling me the voting is not working. Don't, don't go into the chat. Please use the Mentimeter. Does it still say voting is closed for you? Oh, just refresh if it says closed. Okay. But please don't put it into the chat. I'm gonna keep, not going to use it there. Uh, you should be able to vote. Oh, you wanted to repost the link? I can do that. Oh, it looks like somebody did. And there it is again. Thank you, whoever's doing that for me. Okay, we're going to go just another minute. Um, let's see how many people. Um, let's see if anybody has answered so far. Yeah, we're getting a good bunch of stuff. This is going to make a, a word cloud. So I'm not going to go too much further. I'll give you just another 10 seconds, whatever. Keep adding. I see people that keep adding. Um, I really appreciate this. We're not going to look at it right now. We're going to look at it in in five minutes or 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm gonna shut off the voting. We've all had a chance to vote. The voting is now shut off. That's enough uh, for this use. Okay, let's go on. Thanks for doing that. This is an experiment for me. I've never actually used this before in a live talk. So uh, Kalina grac graciously uh, trained me on how to use this tool and helped me better understand uh, how we might be able to use it for this. So I have, oh, I've got to close something here. There we go. So I have 87 parts. We're just gonna cover a few of them probably today. Uh, I have at least two days worth of materials on this. First of all, some disclaimers and a warning. I love this quote from Peter Block. The value of another's experience is to give us hope, not to tell us how or whether to, to proceed. I'm not here to tell you what you should do. I'm here to share some stuff that I think about, some things that I've, tried and I'm gonna I, I want to I'm seeking people who are interested in the conversation that I want to have about this I'm not trying to convince you of anything so please keep an open mind I think it'll give you the most value if you're willing to do that so to start off I, I want to talk about how it started for me why I talk about this subject I, I was involved in a couple projects I'm going to share what those were back in 1999 so the first thing is I in in the January through uh, the end of March in 1999, I worked at a place. I had a three-month contract where we didn't end up using estimates. The whole premise of the place was you can buy our time and we'll do the best for you during that time as we can, but we won't try to guess how much work will get done during that time. And they were very in demand, this particular company, so that worked well for them but they were doing extreme programming and they were highly effective in the work they did. And at the end of that, I thought this has been marvelous. And I wanted to see how the big companies do it. I thought if a small company works that way, I bet you the big companies are even better. Well, I, it turned out I was wrong. And I wanna share with you this little story. Uh, I worked at a firm from about, um, you know, April till October of uh, 1999. And th this was the closest thing to extreme programming. Remember, this is before Agile that I could come upon. They were going to do iterations of six weeks at the end of which they would do a lessons learned. And so we charged off to do our two weeks of estimating, planning, and designing, and then two weeks of coding, and then two weeks of iteration uh, of integration, testing, and fixing. And at the end of that, we did a lessons learned. And these were the prominent things that came up. And I was just a developer there, one of 200 software developers. The estimates were off and they weren't helping us. The requirements weren't clearly understood. And so we had a lot of trouble even trying to do the work. And even then the requirements kept changing during this six week period. Well, I think these things are related, 
but what are we going to do about it? And they decided we need to get better at estimating. We need to get better at gathering requirements and understanding them. And we need to control the changes as they happen. Well, I'm not sure those are the right answers to this, but I wasn't going to speak out. I didn't want to lose my job. It was my first really big job working in software development. I've been coding already for about 20 years, but this was the beginning of a, me changing my career to just being a software developer. Okay, we charged off to do our work the next six weeks, at the end of which they came up with what I would consider the three primary things that failed for them, that they wanted to improve. Now, normally I would ask, can anybody tell me what those are? Well, you can guess what they were. They were the same three things. Well, how are we gonna fix for this? Same three solutions. They gave us training. They actually brought in people to train us and help us get better at this stuff. So we went off to do our next six weeks. So this is our third iteration. And at the end of it, guess what? Same problems, same solutions. I stood up in that meeting at the end of it and I said something to this effect. I think there's a pattern here we should be paying attention to. And I hope you've all seen this is very clearly a pattern. We do our work, we reflect on it, we don't get the improvements we wanted to get, and off we go again to, uh, to do the work. And if this goes on and on, I gave this a pattern name. In those days, we were looking for software development patterns and people were naming them. And I called this the cycle of continuous no improvements. We don't want that, that's a vicious cycle. We want a cycle of continuous improvement. But this turned out to be a pattern I'd already seen many times and I've seen many times since. And that's what I'm addressing here today. If, if we see this, you know, it's prevalent, it's persistent, uh, we probably need to pay attention to it. So what I wanna share with you now is what no estimates is not and a little bit about what I think no estimates is. So it's not, uh, it's not a commandment. I'm not saying thou shalt not use estimates. It's, it's not me demanding what the rest of the industry should do. And also it's not a protest uh, declaration. It's not developers saying we refuse to do estimates and they're marching up and down the hallway uh, during the break. It's not for those making the estimates, it's for those using estimates. I wanna make this really clear. In most organizations, there's somebody up the chain who believes they must use estimates. And so they go down below them and say, you need to give me some estimates. If that's your case, you probably need to keep doing estimates. This isn't gonna solve anything for you. This is for the people using the estimates. Another way to say that is, if we're working within a system that somebody uses estimates, then somebody's gotta make them. Now it could be that very person will use them. It could be people on your development team. It could be some managers in between. It might be another company, whatever it is. Yeah, I'm not telling you stop doing estimates. I don't want you to lose your job. So hopefully we've cleared that up. This started for me as a term, no estimates. Uh, the first time I wrote about this maybe was a little before this, but I wrote this article and a little blog that nobody ever reads and nobody ever read uh, about how I had found ways to not use estimates on an effort I had done. This was actually a story about something that happened in, uh, nine, uh, in 2003, but I'd already had some experiences with it, like that first place I mentioned and other places. By 2012, I had gotten to the point in my career where I was no longer willing to work at a place if they required that we do estimates as developers for somebody else to use. And I wrote a blog post, I mean, I wrote that blog post and then I put a, a link to it in Twitter the same day. And I said, hey, and I used this hashtag. It was the first use of this hashtag within this conversation, which you'll still see it being used to this day. But look at that, that's almost 10 years ago. So again, this was about this blog post where we did not use estimates and therefore we used no estimates, pretty easy. Um, but now it's come to me, for me to mean, this is a conversation I wanna have and no estimates kind of attracts uh, the sorts of people that are willing to discuss this stuff. And I think that's pretty useful. Uh, there's a big question here, and I really want to make this super clear. If we could pretend, this is like a thought experiment. If we could pretend, you know, if we woke up in the morning and all of a sudden it occurred to us that estimating estimates are harmful, using estimates is harmful, what would we do? How would we react to that? This is really the open conversation I'm inviting. If you're willing to entertain that thought, fantastic. 
If you're not, there's probably no conversation that would be interesting to me anyways that I could have with you about this. If you wanna to insist to tell me why we need estimates, I already have heard all the arguments. I'm pretty sure, um, I'm pretty sure that nothing new has come up in the last 10 years. So I, unless you really have come up with something new, I'd love to hear that, but uh, let's go on here. So this is the fourth part. We're moving along pretty good, but we need to have some kind of a definition. What do we mean by estimate? And I'm gonna use what you said and a little exercise that uh, we'll do. We won't really be able to do it uh, because we're online here. And then we're gonna do, uh, a, I'm gonna give you the definition I wanna use. So remember you did this exercise and let's see if I can find my, uh, yeah, that's it there. I'm gonna move this up into uh, our, um, oops, I just need to click on it. There you go. I'm gonna move this up into our screen area. You should be able to see it. So it looks to me like the uh, prominent thing here, which is sort of in the middle, is that an estimate is a guess. Now, enough of you agreed to that to make the prominent thing, but if we really only could group everything uh, that is really about a guess into that word, then anybody who put down guesstimate, uh, or maybe, um, let's see what else I can see there, guessing, um, a measure. I'm, uh, people like to say we can measure the software that we're going to write, but that seems uh, a bit silly to me. But if that's what you believe, I don't think we can measure something that we haven't yet even decided what it's going to be. Often the measuring presupposes a solution. Estimates presuppose a solution. We can estimate something if we really know what we're going to do. I don't think that's software development. But look at that, another one is an approximation. So we could say it's a guess that's an approximation um, about, or a prediction is another way to say it's a guess in my opinion, uh, about the effort. I see we have effort here. We have, um, what else we have? Effort, time. Um, let me see if I can find, so cost. So estimates are usually an approximate guess about the effort, the time, the cost to do something so that we can do some planning, right? So the sizing and all those things sort of fit into that second part of the definition. So let's move on. Uh, thank you for doing this experiment with me. It looks like it worked pretty good. And I actually have done this exercise hundreds of times. And in my records, I can definitely make an estimate for the spread or for the um, results that I will get I can say, and I'm gonna show you this now, I can pretty much say that about somewhere between 25 to 50% of the answers will be it's a guess or an approximation or a prediction. About the time it will, or effort or size of something or the cost so that we can use it for planning and budgeting. An estimate isn't the budget. The, an estimate is something that feeds the budgeting process. And I see usually a lot of dysfunction. Matter of fact, I could see you already had a couple in there. Let me go back to that. Uh, BS is one that you came up with. Uh, it's a manager's drug. Um, let me see if I can find another one. Uh, it's an understanding. Well, I, I, I want to explore that. It's a fantasy. We're talking about the dysfunction of the estimates when we talk about those. It's ridiculous, somebody says. It's a pain. Yeah, so I'll buy into all this. Okay, let's go back to the slides. I hope this is meaningful to you, but we got to do something else to get our definition. So let's do an estimate real quick. Somebody could put this in chat if they want. I won't know if I will be able to see all the chat stuff, but what I'm gonna ask us is I need an estimate for three months for today. How long will it take you to write your name on a white index card with a blue fountain pen? How long will that take? Well, I don't have, uh, I'm gonna see if anybody's put anything into the uh, chat. Uh, oh, I'm estimate. I like that. An hour. Okay. It'll take you an hour to write your name. One minute. I think that's I think I can write my name in about 30 seconds. There's somebody with three seconds. That's probably good. As a matter of fact, I used to have to sign checks. I own a little business. Five seconds. This is good. That be depends. That's the correct answer, of course. And that's the answer that, um, that uh, uh, Robert Martin gives in his talk about the estimate. Pardon me. If I pick up my clicker. It depends. Yeah. So let's look at this. 
So what we've done here is essentially made an estimate for something that we would do three months from now. But what if right this very moment, I want you to write your name on a white index card with a blue fountain pen, okay? How long will that take you? Drop that in the chat real quick. And I'm gonna go back to my chat and have a look. Uh, one day, infinity, five minutes still. So five minutes indicates that you've already got the index card and you've already got the blue fountain pen. But I'm gonna point something out. I've got some index cards here. I, I often have them. I'm gonna show you something. What if we did the work on that card and it came back from testing said, wait a second, that's not a white index card. It's a white index card with blue lines and a red line. Ah, and where's those fountain pens? Used to be everybody had a fountain pen, but even by the time I was a kid, it was really rare to find someone carrying around a fountain pen. So this is the issue that I wanna talk about, or this is what I want to discuss here. This helps us understand something about the kinds of time we might want to estimate about. So we have the work time, we have the cycle time or elapsed time, and we have lead time. Right now, I'm only interested in work time or elapsed time, which is what a lot of people will say, uh, you know, like, well, when will my, my car be done when they want to talk about something like that? They, they don't know how long you're going to actually work on it. It's going to be based on what other work has to get done. It's going to be based on uh, how long it takes to get the parts. We order the parts in the morning. They don't come till the afternoon and so on. So that's the cycle time. The work time is the time we're actually working on it, which has a lot more to do with the, what we might calculate as the cost. But the lead time is essentially about when was the order placed and when can we, you know, and then there's going to be a lot of elapsed time before we can actually start on it. We'll start on that, in, you know, first quarter of 2024. That's the lead time, you know, include that with the work time. So we really are usually talking about work time or cycle time. And we have to know in our estimate why and what we're using there. I'm gonna check our clock so I can make sure I'm staying more or less on schedule. I did time myself on this talk. It's really a lot to cover. So we, I wanna only talk about very specific kinds of estimates. And this is uh, the definition I'm gonna work, use based on what we just learned. An estimate is a guess. It's about the amount of time or maybe the cost or maybe the effort or whatever we wanna be guessing about to do some software, to create some software, a project, a product, a feature, a task, or maybe even a fix or whatever. That's the definition I wanna work with. I don't wanna talk about you know, estimates for getting my roof repaired or estimates for getting a you know, getting a deck built off the back of my house or getting my uh, car fixed. That, that's a whole different domain. We'll talk about domains later. Those are all different domains. So why do we use estimates? We have to better understand this if we're going to have this discussion. And in software development, the estimates are often used to predict the future. We want to know certain things. When will it be done? How much will it cost us? Uh, what can we get done for this sprint or during this sprint? Uh, how big is this thing? Uh, what can we get done for this money? People say, well, what ballpark is it in? What's the order of magnitude? Is this one week or 10 weeks or 100 weeks? What's it going to take? Well, if we can't already, if we're in software development and we can't already sense what that is, uh, we certainly aren't going to be able to estimate it. But that's for you to decide, of course. That's just my point of view. So these aren't facts. What are these? It's a kind of information. The estimate gives us a kind of information, but it's mostly useless in my opinion, because they are those guesses. What good are those guesses? I've actually seen people insist that they can use something like uh, counting function points or uh, that they have this involved process that involves, you know, how many, how many reads from the database, how many inserts into the database, how many other objects we call. Yeah, that presupposes a solution that we already know the solution to the problem we're trying to solve. And in some very simple projects, that might be possible. In other cases, people will take, well, let's look at the big project. Let's pick, take five representational areas, do some uh, calculations in there, and then use a multiplier. So essentially, we're going to multiply a guess times some number. I hope you see that's ludicrous. Uh, it's kind of like using null from a database in a, uh, in a uh, calculation. Null times anything, null divided by anything, null plus anything results in no, a null, excuse me, a guess 
times anything is still just a guess. And to me, it's a kind of a meaningless guess. So what do we do with this information? It's what's important. This is the important thing. And this is what I believe mostly. We need estimates so that we can help, so they can help us make decisions. Is that worthwhile? Well, we'll talk about that. But some people will say, oh no, it's just to spark a conversation. Usually when I dig down in and I say, uh, well, why do we want the conversation? Well, so we get a better understanding. Why do you want a better understanding? So we can determine whether we can bring this into our sprint or not, or something like that. Yeah, in other words, we wanna make a decision. So what are we trying to decide? It's often things like this. Should we do project A or project B? Uh, I am very concerned about that decision. A lot of people say they need this for that. Uh, another one I see often is, should we do this project at all? Another really uh, popular one I see is, which project should we choose for the next fiscal year? And if you're working in that world, I wish the best for you. I hope you survive. That is just such a, uh, well, I would say a difficult way to be successful in a business that we even think that we need to know uh, what we can get done in our budget for the next fiscal year, uh, that goes beyond, uh, yeah, how can we predict that? And yet every company tries to do it. So how many people should we hire? So this is a good one to me because we will often say, we need to estimate how, how long this will take and, and how many people we need. We're get, making guesses about how those people we don't even know, we haven't yet, yet even hired. How effective are they gonna be in their work? Yikes. Okay, we wanna make decisions. Once we've decided to do a project maybe, or it's something or work on a product, we wanna make decisions about prioritizing and scheduling and planning or what to bring into this current sprint. Those are the kinds of decisions we're trying to make. So how useful is this to us? So part six, remember there's only uh, what, 74 more parts. So let's see what we can get to. What's wrong with this? Well, you already know. We're making all these important decisions based on guesses. Are you happy with that? Matter of fact, if we were all sitting in the same room, I would wanna ask this question right now. When you are asked to do an estimate, how happy does that make you feel? Is that a joyous moment? The boss comes to you say, we're starting a new project. We're gonna need your estimates. Here's a stack of papers you need to read. Does that make you happy? And then what if you're that manager and you have to go to your people and say, I need some estimates. Does that make you happy? I got this from Dovel uh, Panchel, who worked at Agile 42 back in the day. And uh, yeah, I don't, why are we doing something that doesn't make us happy? But this is the thing. We're making these decisions, important decision, based on guesses. People will say, estimates help us make decisions. Well, yeah, flipping a coin to help, can help you make a decision. And I can sell you for 25 cents plus shipping and handling, I can sell you a decision-making tool. I usually have a couple in my pocket. Yeah, does that really help us make a decision? And if it does, the estimates, that's not so important. What is important? We need help making good decisions, not merely making decisions. I think we kind of, and we wanna believe estimates help us make good decisions, but uh, hopefully by now you're going, wait, maybe they don't. This is important to consider. How do we prove or evaluate that we've made a good decision? You know, and, what we will often hear is something like, well, on time and on budget. Is it, if that's how you judge whether you've made a good decision, yeah, that's something I would like to ask you to please consider deeply. You've read the Standish Report, the Chaos Report by the Standish Group. They've been doing it every year for years and years. I think they are just now no longer going to do them. Uh, they basically poll the industry and find out how well estimates have worked for people. Are we meeting our deadlines? Are we getting things done? Uh, within our budget. Yeah, I think that's a faulty uh, way to measure the value of our estimates. But we so desperately want to be able to predict the future, we start believing that we can do that. Or if somebody else is insisting, if you're a professional software developer, you must be able to do estimates. That's just wishful thinking, or maybe coercive thinking being used on us. I think we're trying to decide the wrong things. So this is a big part of this, and I'm gonna share just a little bit. We need to understand the domain of software development or what domain software development is within. Uh, if we don't, we're really in trouble because 
I'm only interested in talking about software development uh, and how we use estimates for uh, managing that. So we do, do need to understand what the, that domain is, you know, and kind of it's important for us to understand this. Are there domains where estimates make sense? And there certainly are. There's context where estimates make sense. I can estimate the amount of cost for managing a team for the next year. How many desks we need, how many computers we need, and uh, you know, what is it gonna to take to maintain all that? What are the software upgrades gonna cost? We've, we've got records that help us know that, and we can easily make a kind of prediction that is close enough to being useful to determine what our budget for next year, year should be. We usually add a little padding to make sure within our budget. That's wonderful. But let's try to understand something about domains. And what I wanna share with you is Kinevin. You've probably already seen dozens of talks on Kinevin. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that right. People will pronounce this many different ways, but I've heard uh, Dave Snowden, the guy who came up with this, heard him pronounce it and explain how it, what it means. So that's the way I say it. Kinevin is like Kevin, but Kinevin. So, whoops, um, it's a sense-making framework. Now, I don't believe any of the tools that I use provide me with truth. They provide me with insights that I can use. And if uh, this sense-making framework works for someone, I'm really pleased to hear that, but that's, it works for me. It's helped me understand more about the nature of software development. I think I first read about it in 2007, along with other papers like um, from Jack Reeves and of course, uh, Ed Jordan and others about software projects. And this really rang a bell with me. This is sort of what, the way I saw things. They have these five, uh, uh, they call them domains. In the center, there's a domain, and then there's the four domains that go around it. The, cent the center domain is a, really about paradoxes or confusion. We don't really understand what space we're in. And usually if we're in there, uh, there might be elements in the work we're doing that fits into all these domains. I'm gonna explain kind of what they are real quickly with a little example. Uh, it goes like this. This is a basket of, or a, a can of dough. You open it up and you make some biscuits. We call them biscuits, I guess, uh, muffins or so. I don't know what you call them other places. If you just follow the instructions, it's gonna work every time, unless you're really a bad chef like me. But most of the time this is good. You just take the dough out, you put it on a pan, preheat your oven to a certain degree, put the thing in there for a certain number of minutes. We're just following the instructions. There are no unknowns. We don't need to really decide anything. The next domain is called complicated. So I like those biscuits that come in a can, but if I want really good biscuits, I might wanna to go to a really good baker who has all the knowledge to make melt in your mouth, really wonderful croissants or whatever you like. This is the complicated space. It takes an expert. We have to have a lot of knowledge and expertise about what we're doing. They are not exactly following a recipe or a set of instructions because each day is gonna be different. The amount of moisture in the air, the humidity, uh, the temperature in the room, the temperature of our stove, uh, all of these things vary from day to day based on the environment we're in. So we gotta pay a lot of attention if we're gonna be able to do this. But there are no unknowns that we don't know that we need to answer. In other words, there are known unknowns. This is a good space to be in. If you can get, uh, if you can work in this space, it's estimates are probably useful for you. But look at this space, it's called complex. And I use the example of molecular gastronomy. I had to put it there because I have trouble saying that every time I try to say it. It's a process of discovery. There are unknowns and we don't know what those unknowns even are. So we can't say we need to find out the answer to this because those won't reveal themselves until we're deep into it. Here's the thing. In this space, we are really trying to discover things. In this space, we can't even solve the problem until we've tried to follow, find some solutions. You might start out in this process and say, we're gonna invent a new meat sauce, you know, that's gonna work really well on, you know, a steak. And we stumble upon by our experiments, something that seems like it would be a really good dessert. So instead we focus on making that dessert. Now, once we really figured it out, it could turn into a recipe that could be used in the complicated domain. But while we're doing the inventing, the innovation, the discovery, we're in the complex space. Lastly, we have chaotic. 
And that's, of course, where uh, my cooking goes. You know, this is, uh, I call this, my biscuits are burning from Yosemite Sam. When, if you go to the stove, you see the smoke coming out of it and you go, oh no, the biscuits are on fire. Uh, you don't have time to do much sensing or responding. You need to take action. You are gonna sense, these are sort of done at the same time. We sense, uh-oh, we got a fire. I know if I wet down a, uh, a kitchen towel uh, and open the oven and throw the kitchen towel over this burning stuff, we're gonna be okay. We take action quickly. So what space are we in? With the chaotic space, once we've put out the fire, then we can, we've moved into one of those other domains. So this is why I think it's important to understand the domains because the tactics and techniques that we will use are gonna vary from domain to domain. Most people that I have interacted with who are really uh, happy using estimates, I think that they believe they're in the complicated domain and not in the complex domain. I think the complex domain is where software development is. And if we really aren't doing anything uh, in our development that is in the complex domain, we probably aren't doing actual software development. We might be doing something more like uh, software configuration or something like that. And maybe our development is repeating work that we've already done many times. And there's a secret to that, of course, stop repeating. If you've written something once and then written it again, that's probably the time to say, hey, this is a generalized pattern and start thinking about the commonality within it and how we could use it by not writing it over and over and either add some configuration to it or remove the variability into some, that's the area we still need to develop each time we work with this already discovered pattern of code. So if software development is really development, I think we're in the, uh, the place of uh, the complex domain where there are unknown unknowns and this requires discovery. If you find yourself not in the complex space, then I would want to scrutinize, are we really developing anything? Now, we've stayed on track pretty good. So I'm gonna do this last part, which is where I talk a little bit about what I have done. Now, I've gotta be really careful with this. So all the stuff I just covered, um, I covered too briskly. I'm not expecting you to really have grasped everything I've said. And is any of it important? I don't know. It's just the way I think. But this, we're now to a po point where we can think about, well, what would we do if we couldn't use estimates or if estimates were harmful? That's the way I really like to think of it. If you woke up in the morning and you had an epiphany and said, you know, I don't think these estimates are helping us, but I even think they're harming us. What would you do to resolve that? If you could prove it to yourself, and uh, hopefully I've given you enough to think about that at least that's a start. So I, of course, have to give the warning. The, the, the warning that I first gave is the value of another's experience isn't to tell us what we should do, whether or not we should do something. It's to help us understand there are probably options. I've worked without estimates for, in some form or another, for well over 40 years, but uh, in software development for over 20 years now, but uh, in a very focused way for about the last 12 to 14 years. Matter of fact, I think since 2009, I've not done a single estimate in software development and done worked on many projects in that time. Uh, I'm not suggesting how you should work. You know, I'm really just sharing one approach that I've used and has worked for me in many cases. I've used some other approaches and I hope others will find and share their own ways of working without the estimates. Uh, people like Vasco Duarte and uh, Neil Killick and others who've written about this and were involved in the discussions we were having 10 years ago, I think have done some marvelous work on how they've worked this way. The way I choose is how I'm gonna share you now with you now. This is the way I look at it. Somebody comes to us as a team and says, here is the project we want you to work on. This is an artistic representation of the project. This you could think of as a set of requirements. It's like a requirements document. And I'm gonna hold up something here that for my example as I go, is gonna represent the requirements document. All this stuff is defined about what we want out of this project. We have presupposed a solution usually. This is why I don't think things like counting uh, function points or other sorts of estimates that say when a project or product will be done really doesn't work because what we thought we wanted before we went into it was is usually not what we really should end up with. 
but this is what uh, a big problem we have. So is it this way? Well, I don't think it is. I think that uh, the project before we really start on it looks something more like this. Now we could spend a lot of time trying to turn this into this, but that's work of development. The, the putting together of the requirements is part of the development of the software. And I think we're misguided if we think we can do that in this isolated environment where we're only thinking about uh, what we might want or what the customer might want, uh, and rather than experimenting and delivering things. That's what this process is about. So if this is what our project really is, there's a lot of patterns in there. I can see these lines that kind of look familiar or similar in different places, different colors that kind of match up, uh, splotches that kind of match up. Uh, we can kind of see there is something in there, but we really can't see it as hard as we study it, as much as we want to believe we can see it. But I think our projects are really, really like this. They're fuzzy around the edges and in the middle. We have no clarity whatsoever. The patterns that we think we see are obscured by other things. And we might be seeing things that aren't really patterns at all, which is a human condition. You know, this is all humanity sees patterns in things that don't exist. That's a well-known psychological, uh, they used to think it was an affliction that the only crazy people had it. So either we're all crazy or it's not just for crazy people. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, I, this is my process. This is the way I typically work. Doesn't mean I'll work for you. I gotta be really clear here. I just wanna find something that's interesting, some small thing I can work on. And this does not require an estimate. This is the problem I think a lot of people have in understanding this. What it comes down to this, I look for certain qualities. And if the software has these qualities, it will match up with what we might consider to be small, but it, not necessarily, but this is typically what I find. These are the qualities I'm looking for. Is this discrete and distinct? Now those are really related words and they often use the one to describe the other, but you can think of the forest and the trees, okay? The forest is the whole project, but there, you can't look at it and say, you can't specify the distinctness of it till you get down into the forest and you find a tree. Now you have something that's discrete and distinct. The quality of this is that it's understandable in of, of itself, that it is potentially, I want it to be potentially valuable and it needs to be cohesive. So often when we look at a project, we see this one thing and we go, that's distinct. I can understand it. It makes sense. I can identify it as being a thing I can work on. And somebody else maybe needs to make the judgment, yeah, we think this could be useful if we could have it. The cohesiveness is a problem because when we're looking at that distinct thing, we don't really see beyond this thing about the environment of it. So we have to look for cohesiveness. Are all the things here, do they belong together? Is there something missing that should be with this? This is not uh, easy to do. It takes a great deal of thought and requires a lot of judgment. And I would cons uh, consider that maybe you could call some of this estimates. That's for you to decide. I don't see any of this as estimating at all. By the time we're done with this, we end up with something we can work on. This requires no estimates. When these qualities are found and I have something I can work on, then it can be decoupled, it can be worked on, it can be deployed, it can be used, and it can provide feedback. And here's the key. It allows us to steer way more important to me to be able to steer than to know how much something will cost or how long it will take when that information is all based on guesses. We've eliminated guessing. Now, the next thing we choose to do is the steering. We've learned something. Let's choose the next meaningful thing to work on. It's all about the steering. I'm going to emphasize that. It's all about the steering. Agile is about steering, responding to change over following the plan. This is critical. If we don't get that, we probably don't understand anything about an iterative way of working. Even IID in the old days meant we're gonna iteratively do something and we're gonna incrementally deliver it, but almost nobody actually delivered it. But when we find that thing we can work on, we can deploy it and we get the learning that we want to get, then we can choose the next thing. It informs our decisions. Now, really quickly, let me give an example. 
of how I would work this. I had a project brought to me. They were trying to add a reporting functionality in a project in the old days of monolithic projects. They had a requirements document that was something like 120 pages with 80 features. They estimated everything. They chose what to do. They prioritized everything. That's a lot of work to do without any value. And they worked on it about a year and nothing was working. They had nothing deliverable. And their original project, they couldn't even do bug fixes that were found in the old code because the new code was the only thing they still had that was really deployable. I went in, they asked me, well, how do we deal with this? And I said, I don't know how to deal with that because you've got all this broken stuff that's not working. I know everything you want, but I can't understand all that. What we did is we refer, we reversed the code. We, we brought it back to the original state before they started working on it. That was a big loss. All this work they'd done that wasn't working. And I asked the boss, what in here would be most interesting to you if you could use it tomorrow? And he picked out something. It happened to be a purple one. I like purple, and that was a good choice, I think, on his part. Always look for the purple, purple cards. Right? And I said, hey, that's great. So I read it, came back to him in a couple hours and said, there's a lot here I don't understand. Can you make it clear to me? He tried to do that. I said, I think I understand. There's three parts to this. Let's work on one of the three parts. If I delivered that, would that be useful? And actually, in this case, it would be. I'm going to look at what's cohesive, what can be decoupled. And I went about doing that. I removed some parts. And then I looked for the stuff that was missing. And we ended up from that first story of this much stuff, this much we could work on. And we worked on it. We literally got it done in a day. We, we uh, had a prototype in a day. Uh, we showed it to the boss. We said, we're going to deliver this at the end of the week because we want to test it fully. And we deployed it. Then the next, uh, the next week, I said, what do you want to work on? He said, well, this other part of this is important. So we picked off the other third, and we did the same thing to it. We ripped away the stuff that wasn't cohesive, the stuff that we could decouple, and we worked on it. We've now done this much of this much work. We did that three or four times. Then I went to the boss, and I said, yeah, what's next? What's next? And you know what he said? Some of you are guessing already. That's enough. I have this other thing that's more important. We moved to a completely different project. They'd been stalled on for a year because they'd been estimating and committing to doing the work. I hope you understand this. This has to do with the Pareto principle. If 20% of what we do provides 80% of what we want to get out of this, let's just do that 20%. Let's stop estimating everything. It looks like this. However, if we choose something we think is in the 20% and we pull it out, then let's only do 20% of that. That's what we were doing here. That's what I was representing by ripping up these cards. We end up doing something this, if we do this purely, we would only need to do 4% of the work in a project. This to me is what Agile is. So I call this deliver features until bored. As soon as they're bored, why do we keep working on these things? But many projects are committed to, and they do the whole thing, and we end up with dozens of features nobody ever uses. Yikes, very expensive. What if we could crank up our ability to find the value, to discover and steer? And of course, if you're listening to an Agile talk, we need to put that in a circle. If you ever go to an Agile training and they don't have any circles, that's not really Agile training, right? And so I made a circle for you. Well, what if we could do this over and over again, get many chances at discovering value? To me, this is a much better way of working. This is what I prefer to do. I prefer not to work with estimates and I haven't had to for many years now. So that's it. I think we've covered too much. I've left you only nine minutes to answer, to ask questions. I have about 10 more slides we could do, but I think we've covered enough. <laughs>